We're going to remain in Scotland for this, this next talk, and I'm going to talk about a massive amount of work that's gone on looking at salmon migration, and particularly smolt migration as they first migrate to sea, not just in Scotland, but right round uh, the, the islands that comprise Ireland and, and the United Kingdom. Before I go on, I'd like to recognize uh, three people who have, have led an enormous amount of, of work that I'm going to talk about. Uh, they are Jess Roger, uh, Jesse Lilly, and Han Honkinen. I'm standing here representing uh, their words to some extent. So, why should we be even interested in what happens uh, during long distance migration as, as salmon migrate to sea? Well, all of the last three speakers have mentioned uh, what we've got in front of us. Salmon numbers are declining, sometimes fast, sometimes less fast, but almost everywhere they're declining. You don't need much more from me on that. Lorraine has also mentioned the fact that what seems to be happening is that the uh, success of the migration to sea and then returning back from sea has been declining over time. The data that we've got in front of us is, is is where we've got some data over long periods of time of the success rate, just measuring those number of fish that come back from sea relative to the proportion that, that, that go out to sea in the first place. And it looks like marine migration success rate has been declining over time, and that in part is resulting in declining populations. We shouldn't forget, however, that we're all interested in Atlantic salmon in this, in this, uh, in this room here today, but of course, there are lots of long-distance migrants ac across the animal kingdom. In fact, it's very difficult to find an animal group where there aren't long-distance migrants, and we can learn quite a lot about the process of migration in Atlantic salmon by looking at what's been done in other species. And there's one sort of consistent pattern that I want to pull out of, of what we know about migration in general, and that is that migration is really risky. It's risky whatever species you are, and it's risky if you're an Atlantic salmon. So, um, the technology that's allowed us to look at migration patterns, and particularly in fish, has come on leaps and bounds in the last decade or so. Technically, that, that, uh, I, I mean that it's, a, it's developed technically. We can tag fish, we can track fish uh, through rivers, through coastal zones, and out to sea by using acoustic telemetry, small tags that produce a, an acoustic signal that can be picked up by a receiver. Those are the receivers up there. Let me just find the on button. Yes, there's a receiver there. It's about the size of a Coke bottle. There is a tag. It can be inserted into a fish. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, the smallest ones can be inserted into smolts. And if you strategically place the receivers in rivers and coastal waters and and even out quite well out to sea, you can get some information on migration patterns, migration behavior, and migration success. And that is what uh, a large, uh, has, has attracted a large amount of effort in Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and Northern England over the last few years. This is a very messy slide, but just let me try and describe it a little bit. Uh, each of the stars is a river where uh, salmon have been uh, tagged uh, in 2021. Uh, these splodges here and these individual dots are receivers that have been placed at sea. And this is the sort of cumulative pattern of 10 uh, research projects that are, were active in 2021, comprising 30-odd researchers from 24 institutions. And in 2021, about 1,800 uh, Atlantic salmon smolts were uh, captured and tagged on their way to sea from 23 rivers. A massive amount of money has gone into this and a mass massive amount of, of, of energy. And I want to mention the two biggest projects that were involved in this. One is the uh, West Coast Tracking Project that's led by the Atlantic Salmon Trust. Uh, and the other big project is an EU uh, Interreg funded project which was called Sea Monitor. I'm really glad to say that all of these projects have started to bring their data together to allow us to get so much more added value from all of these projects by effectively collaborating and sharing data and, and analyzing the data jointly. 
What I don't have time to do today is to run through all of the data that we've got. So what I'm going to do is try and just take one single river catchment, and I want to follow the fish as they migrate to sea and draw some conclusions from what, we've, what we, can, we can take from those, that, that, that particular migration. And the, the catchment I want to use is the Clyde catchment, and particularly fish that were tagged in the River Endrick as they migrate out and out through the Clyde estuary and out into the open sea. Of course, we have to capture the fish, we have to tag the fish, and then release the fish. Um, and for the Endrick fish, then they have to pass through river, through the freshwater part of the river. They also have to pass through a standing water, a lake, into an estuary, and then out into the, the, the coastal zone. So that makes them interesting in respect that there's a multiplicity of different kinds of habitats that they have to migrate through. So there they are being tagged in the Endrick. They've got to migrate through the southern part of Loch Lomond, down the River, river Leven, out into the inner, then the outer estuary. These orange bands are places where we've set up curtains of receivers so that we're able to detect the fish as they pass past those points. Out to sea, this is the collective uh, suite of receivers that I just showed you across all 10 of these projects, which are, are collaborating by sharing data. And of course, our Clyde fish are going to have to migrate through here. And of course, they're going up to the, the North Atlantic somewhere. So our assumption is that they're probably going to come out here and, and migrate up north. I should mention this thing here, which is an autonomous vehicle, which is a, it's a, it's a slocum glider, it's called, and it's been as part of the Sea Monitor project, it's been zigzagging its way backwards and forwards across the continental shelf edge, trying to detect smolts as they pass. And without, willing to, without uh, wishing to steal on thunder, it has detected some, some fish doing that. So let's begin with the, the beginning of the, of the migration. Fish released at uh, the trapping site, tagged and released. Uh, here we've got static receivers that are detecting the fish as they're passing down the Endrick heading towards the sea. But in 2020, and again in 2021, we decided we wanted to collect some additional data. We wanted to actively track. And so that meant getting a crew into a canoe and canoeing down the River Endrick every day for several weeks uh, and detecting uh, fish with a receiver that was passing downstream on the canoe. So that means we were able to detect every single tag that was in that river, not just tags that were very close to receivers. One of the advantages of that is we can determine if a tag is now not in the river for any particular reason. And the only real way in which a tag can leave a fish and get out of the river and onto the bank or further away is if that fish is predated by an animal that takes the fish out of the river, or of course, obviously, it could migrate migrate downstream and, and out of the river, in which case we'd be able to detect it. So we were able to use that to determine the level of losses during the Endrick migration. Phenomenal amount of, of losses. 64% of fish that were tagged did not even make it out of this riverine stretch. And we, uh, that was quite surprisingly high. But what was even more astonishing was that 42% of those losses were the result of bird predation. So what was the take-home message from that riverine bit? Well, we know, not just from this study, but from lots of other studies, that, that salmon smolts use river flow as a means of, of, uh, of, of navigating, of directional, they're, they're finding their direction by the direction of the flow. Migration loss in, in this particular river was exceedingly high, but that's not always the case. The pattern elsewhere across the suite of, of data that we've been collecting on the west coast of Scotland and in Ireland and Northern Ireland is showing that that's not always the case. Sometimes riverine migration is, 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 is quite successful. But bird predation, again, in this particular river, very high indeed. So then, of course, our, our smolts get into the standing water, Loch Lomond. These black dots uh, are a, a suite of receivers laid out in a grid fashion, and this grid fashion gives us some really nice information. Um, and it gives us some information particularly on the pattern of how smolts are getting through Loch Lomond. Again, migration loss exceedingly high, 43% of the fish that uh, came into, that migrated into Loch Lomond did not make it out of Loch Lomond. That's a 
terrific attrition rate. Um, we know that around 14% of those were lost to bird predation. The rest, we just, we just don't know where they've gone. But this grid system is giving us some really interesting information on why the attrition rate is potentially so high in Loch Lomond. On the left-hand panel here, um, this is the direct route for migration for smolts. Out of the river here, straight down to the southwest, and then down into the, the, the river that exits Loch Lomond. Nine kilometers should take about five hours for your average uh, swimming smolt. Look at this. This is a, a real track of a real uh, migrant that was ultimately successful in migrating out of the lake. It traveled 200 and nearly 250 kilometers. It took over three weeks to make this migration all over the place, round Loch Lomond, at, but ultimately was success, successful, but it took a considerable amount of, of time. What's happening? Well, it's also happening elsewhere. Very low rates of, of, of migration success through standing water. We've now got data, empirical data, from, from five lakes in the UK, and here's the migration losses, very high indeed. So what's happening? Well, we think that what's happening is that fish are getting very confused. There's a complete loss of the navigation cues that they need for migration. Remember, in the river, they're able to orientate because of the flow, the Rio tactic, we call that. The flow rates in, in standing waters are, by definition, very low or non-existent at all. So we think that smolts are actually switching their navigation strategy, and they're switching to a random search strategy. We know about these kinds of search patterns that are used by, by other animals. And so we've tried to, to see if that's probably the case. And we've done that by, by running models, random search models. And what we found was that random walk models, uh, we applied those to all five of the lakes that we've got good empirical data for, and we found that they quite nicely predicted migration success and migration time and, and pathway length. So it looks rather like smolts are switching their navigation strategy because they have no alternative. They have no good cues for making a migration through, through lakes. However, that does seem to switch when the fish get very close to the outflowing river. So this area of, the, of Loch Lomond, where the fish were very close to at the outflowing river, um, a high percentage of them migrated successfully by making very directed um, directed migrations towards the outflowing, outflowing river. So we think at that point, and we're calling this zone the Goldilocks zone, because here the environmental cues are just right for the fish to be able to, to orientate and migrate successfully. Um, so they're switching back to rheotaxis, switching back to using flow as a mechanism to, to, to navigate. So what's the take-home message? Well, lake migration is consistently uh, associated with very high loss rates of migrating fish. It's very slow. Bird predation might be a problem. It certainly is in, in Loch Lomond, but it may be variable from place to place. And importantly, navigation mechanisms seem to switch. They seem to switch from, from one methodology to another methodology and back again. Understanding these fundamental principles that the fish are using to, 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 to navigate are really quite important, particularly in cases where we may want to manipulate that, particularly in cases where there's impoundments. So our fish now end up uh, in the estuary. Uh, they're migrating out through the inner Clyde, the outer Clyde. Um, we know from a lot of work that is done, uh, has been done on, in, in this in Norway, in fjords and, and estuaries, that our expectation should be that uh, estuary migration is associated with very high loss rates indeed. And there's lots of reasons for imagining that that would be the case in the Clyde as well. We've got the, the UK submarine, nuclear submarine fleet is based there. There's still shipbuilding, commercial trawling. There's lots of predators. Our expectation would be that success rate through the estuary is particularly poor uh, in the Clyde. And in fact, it's not. It's exactly the opposite. Um, the success rate is about five times higher distance for distance uh, through the estuary for smolts migrating through the estuary than it is for them migrating through, through fresh water. So again, we've got a significant inconsistency about what to expect uh, as our smolts are migrating into the first stages of their, their marine environment 
uh, migration. Uh, here, we're getting very high success rates. Um, what we are finding is consistency in the pathways that they're using. All the fish, not all the fish, but almost all the fish are using the same kind of pathways in the estuary. So our fish are now getting out to sea. I've shown this diagram already. Um, and uh, we're finding there is a, a receiver line that goes between uh, Malin Head and the island of Isla in Scotland. And we found that our Clyde fish are actually clustering quite tightly. That's a heat map of detections on that, that array, which is very, uh, it's very discreet. So most of our Clyde fish are actually passing through this north channel, the channel out into the, into the North Atlantic, all in the same place. But try and put that into context of where other fish are going. Well, it's an absolute mess. Uh, fish from other parts of, uh, other, parts of other, other rivers where they've been tagged are all taking slightly different routes. Uh, here's a Clyde fish going through here, but other rivers are actually taking very different routes through this relatively uh, narrow passage. Um, the Clyde fish are taking a slightly more northerly uh, direction. What's really interesting and quite important is that our Clyde fish are going around the outside of the Outer Hebrides, not going through the inside of the Outer Hebrides. And the reason which, for that concern is that, in fact, sorry about that, um, this is an area of very high um, density of, of aquaculture. I'm just going to finish up with one. This is my last slide, honest. Um, just what's our take-home message for this? Well, different rivers are using different pathways, at least uh, in the, the nearshore coastal zone. Uh, fish from the same river seem to have quite reasonably tightly defined pathways. So there's within river consistency, but between river differences. Um, and I haven't covered this, and I'm not going to have time to, but there's evidence that marine navigation mechanisms, the mechanisms they use to find direction, are switching uh, when they enter the marine environment. Lastly, just like to say that none of this is possible without literally dozens of people. Um, this is only a small fraction of them. I think there's only 30 of about 40 faces out there that have helped produce the data that I've at least given you a glimpse of in a very short space of time. Thank you, Peter.